Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. We are super excited. I am your host, Dr. Shimona Wimbley, and I am excited. Welcome to another episode of Faithful Moments. And so on tonight, we have a very special guest. Y'all see, I'm, I'm jumping right in because I don't want to waste any time. We, we, this program tonight is going to be loaded, 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 extremely loaded. You are going to hear um, a story and a journey from a very phenomenal young lady. I had the pleasure of meeting through another special guest. And I am super excited. What I'm going to do, I am going to, um, first, I'm going to digress a little bit so I can I can um, just say a quick prayer with you all before we get going in here. And I'm just trying to click all these off. So, Father God, we just thank you for this time of fellowship, Father God. We thank you for each and every person that has taken the time out to connect with us on today. Father God, we pray that whatever message, whatever um, word that you would like for someone to receive on tonight, that they are in position to receive it. Father God, may you open their ear gates so that they can receive. Father God, open their eye gates. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, we just come before your throne of grace. Yes, of mercy, Father God, and just repenting for all of our sins. Father God, we stand in the gap for each and every one of our family members, our listeners, Father God. And we just lift them up to you, yes, Father God, yes. in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. We pray that you will cover us from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet yes. in the blood of Jesus and that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Yes. In Jesus' yes. name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys, I have this special young lady here on with me tonight. I'm just repositioning my little cards here. Okay. Okay, okay. There we are. Our special guest tonight, her name is Samet George. And she is from Pennsylvania. So let me tell you a little bit about Miss Samlet. She's and you a call Sam. Sam's good. Okay, Miss Sam. Okay, Miss Sam is a deaconess at the Word of God in Christ. I'm sorry, Word of God at her church, Trinity Church of God, located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. She has a true passion to speak about the Word of God and has um, been used as an education, educate, educator, and practitioner in the cosmetology world for more than four decades. How about that? And you love gardening too? Yeah, I love gardening too. <laughs> wow. After being diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and stage four brain <laughs> cancer, did y'all hear that? She was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and stage four brain cancer. God spoke to her about how he needed to use her to draw others to his kingdom by curing her from the uncurable. Y'all, this story is going to blow y'all away. Mm -hmm. Sam knew that she had an awesome responsibility to open her mouth and let everyone know that God is still on the throne and he is still in the miracle working business. Did y'all hear that? Yes, that's why we call this show Faithful Moments. Putting yes. your faith to work. Not just hearing the word of God, but guess what? Standing on that word and executing that. What the word says that we have, what we shall take possession. You just have to connect your faith to the word. Amen. So she published her book called Few Are Chosen, which tells us how faith can overcome impossible situations. <laughs> She has been married since 1990 to Deacon Curtis George, who has joined her in their ministry. Together, they have two beautiful daughters and four wonderful grandchildren. We want to welcome her right here, right now, to Faithful Moments. You guys, give her a warm welcome. Woo! Yes. 
Welcome, Miss Sam. How are you? I am feeling better than blessed. Amen. Listen, when I started reading your story and your testimony, I was literally tearing up. I'm serious because how many people would just give up when they hear that they have a, 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 a lifeline of a certain amount of time? And so I am going to um, digress a little bit and give you the floor so you can give yourself an even better <laughs> um, introduction to our audience, if you would, please. Okay. Well, like she said, I'm a, a deaconess at the uh, tr at Trinity Church of God here in Harrisburg, and occasionally um, I do a little speaking, but. Tonight, I'm here to share my testimony with you, which is going to, uh, which I call the most miraculous season of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a, a little more than a year ago, it hasn't been long. In fact, this month, I'm celebrating a one-year anniversary, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But a little more than a year ago, I went on a, a vacation quickly uh, to Disney with my family. And when we returned from Florida, I was coughing a little and had a little chest pain. So uh, my husband took me to the ER. I assumed that after dodging COVID for two years, it finally caught up with me. So we went to the hospital and they did a lot of tests and wanted to rule out some other things because of my age, like heart attack and things. And after giving me lots of tests, they came back and said I wasn't having a heart attack and I didn't have COVID, but the x-ray showed that I didn't have pneumonia. And that if I just took the prescription and rested a couple of days and a couple of weeks, I should feel much better and the cough should dissipate. Well, after a few uh, weeks, when it didn't go away, I contacted my primary physician and told him that I had uh, picked up pneumonia and I'm still having a cough. So he told me he would quickly access my records and see what was going on. Well, the next thing I know, he calls me that afternoon and said that I may have had pneumonia, but the x-ray also showed that there was a mass on my lung and he wanted to get me to a specialist right away. So after a day or so, I met with the uh, specialist via Zoom and uh, he told me to set up an appointment to go in and get a biopsy because it was the only way they would know really what that mass was. After getting a biopsy, I got a call back from the doctor and he told me that uh, his results showed that the mass was third stage lung cancer, which really blew me away because I never smoked cigarettes and we don't have a uh, history of cancer in the family. So I, I just wasn't sure. I kept thinking he was speaking to the wrong person. And uh, he said, no, he assured me it was me. He held up my, it was via Zoom. He held up my uh, report with my birth date and my name and my picture. And he said, is this you? And I said, yes. He said, well, then you have third stage lung cancer and it's spreading fast. And I remember saying, I don't understand any of this. And how do you know it's spreading fast? He said he accessed the hospital records that were taken, the x-rays four weeks ago that showed they had pneumonia with a small mass and that uh, the biopsy x-ray showed that the mass had increased uh, dramatically in size in four weeks. So immediately he said he'd be sending me, uh, having his team reach out to me to figure out how we can get this off. He said, the mass is too large for me to surgically remove right now, but it has to come off. So we need to shrink it. So I'm gonna have all kinds of people calling you all week uh, to take all kinds of scans and tests so we know whether we should shrink it with chemotherapy or whether we should shrink it with radiation. Mm -hmm. As soon as I heard the news, of course, I called my husband and my family and I shared it with them. And directly after that, I called my pastor and told him what I was told. And he said, okay. He said, the first thing we have to do is get some people together. He said, I'll call out to some prayer warriors here at church and you ground up some family and friends and we need to start doing some praying and fasting immediately. So he put together a, a fast. It was a week of uh, just having juice. I started with a half an hour of prayer in the morning followed by juice and then a half an hour of prayer in the evening followed by only fruit. And we did this for a week. And um, at the end of the fast, the fast went from a Monday to the following Sunday night at midnight. And when I woke up Monday morning, I woke up, uh, my pillow was wet, my eyes were crusted shut, and I just really wasn't sure what was going on. I could hardly open them up. So 
Um, I quickly cleaned off my eyes trying to figure out what was going on. I wasn't too concerned about the wet pillow because I have hot flashes. And so uh -huh. like, the whole bed is wet. So, but after I cleaned off my eyes, I kept trying to figure out what is going on. Why, why are my eyes crusted shut? What's going on? And I remembered that I was crying in my sleep. And then I started to think a few minutes later, why was I crying? And then I remember that I had a dream. And then as time went on a few minutes later, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And I remember, wait a minute, I remember I had a dream that God spoke to me. And then as a few more minutes went by, within a, probably an hour or so, it was very clear to me that it was not a dream. I put together every puzzle, puzzle and it was so clear. I can remember the tone. Uh, the voice, I can remember the uh, pitch, the sound. I knew that it was not a dream that God actually spoke to me. And when I first realized that, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to tell anybody at first because I kept thinking people are going to say I'm crazy because I'm not saying God laid it on my heart or I felt it in my spirit. God spoke to me with a voice the same way I'm speaking to you right now. Mm -hmm. So after about three hours, I decided to share it with my husband first. And um, I said, remember what I was going through this morning? I, I figured it out. I said, you might not believe this. And it probably sounds a little crazy. I said, but God spoke to me in my dream. It, it wasn't a, a dream that I had him in. He actually spoke to me in a real voice. I said, and I was afraid to tell you earlier because I just don't want anybody to think I'm crazy. And my husband, right away, he said, Sam, if there's one person God has favored, it's you. He said, I believe everything you're saying. He said, um, call the pastor, let people know. We just, we need to, to continue that prayer. That prayer is definitely giving us some direction. Oh, now. And so um, all week long, I'd gone through the, the different tests and um, we were getting ready to head out on our, on a little voyage. It was a maiden voyage that we were taking in a motor coach. When I thought I had pneumonia, my husband and I decided, let's start, stop using public transportation. Let's stop flying and using hotels. We like to travel. And let's just get a motor coach and do our own thing for a while until this COVID thing dies down. Well, the day we're literally like five minutes getting ready to pull out the driveway to go on this uh, weekend vacation to just kind of process what God has said to me and just get some quiet time and just trying to figure out what our next move would be. Right before we pull out, I get a phone call from the doctor saying the last of his test results came back to figure out how to shrink this third stage um, mass that was on my tongue and uh, on my lung. And he told me he was sorry to inform me that it wasn't third stage cancer, that it was fourth stage cancer, and that it had already gone to my brain. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. He explained even then that it was not reversible, curable, or survivable, but they would do everything they could to extend my days. My God. Of course, now, right. I'm going to stop you right there because for some people hearing that, they, some people would begin to adjust their life to the narrative that they just heard. But I believe that you did something different. Well, first of all, I'd say that I felt honored. I know it sounds crazy, but I felt so honored. All I could think about was God spoke to me. He let me know in his speech or in his words, mm -hmm. he literally called my name and he said, Sam, this is not about you. It's all about me. I need to use you to oh. let my light shine through, to be a beacon, to draw others to my kingdom. There are too many who do not believe I'm still on the throne and in the miracle making business. I just need to use you. Miss Sam, so, can you say that again? He said, Sam, this is not about you. It's all about me. I need to use you to let my light shine through to be a beacon to draw others to my kingdom. There are too many that do not believe I'm still on the throne and in the miracle making business. I just need to use you. So I just, I couldn't really get past that. That's all I heard for days and days. And the more I heard it and the more I felt it, it was like, oh my God, 
of all the people in the world he could have selected, and not even just the people in Harrisburg or Pennsylvania or the United States or what, of all the people in the world, he gave me this assignment. And I just, I felt honored. I felt honored. And from that point, I started telling people from the very beginning, because people would talk and say, oh, we're so sorry to hear about this. Um, what are you going to do? And, and I just told them, I'm going to sit back and watch God work. Come on. He already told me he's just going to use me. So I feel honored. And honestly, I got up every day and prayed and said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this. Because I know that in the end, there's going to be a testimony. And here I am. Yes. <laughs> and now, even, as we, even as we started the process, uh, once I got to the, the brain specialist, uh, well, first of all, I had a couple doctors who were not believers in God. One, the first doctor told me there was no God. Uh, the second doctor tried to calculate my days. And then finally, I got to the right doctor um, who told me, yes, the brain surgeon said, yes, I believe in God. He said, but the strangest thing about this, he said, you are the first person I would have ever done a craniotomy on. That means cutting off your, peeling back your wig, cutting off your skull with a saw and taking off the tumor and then plopping it back on and stapling it and that type of thing. He said, you are the very first person I've ever done a craniotomy on who has never had one symptom, not a headache, no blurred vision, no seizures, no dizzy spells, no stumbling, no uh, loss of vision, just... He said, it just is unbelievable. He said, but the x-ray here shows that you have this ball that's sitting on your um, brain. That's a tumor. And all these little things around it shows us that the cancerous tumor that is spreading throughout your brain, which lets us know it's cancer. Wow. So he sent me out for lots of tests. And he calls me the night before surgery and says, are you ready, ready for surgery tomorrow? And I say, yep, I told you, I'm all prayed up. From the very beginning, I asked him if he believed in God. And he looked at me with a crazy look and said, of course I do. So I told him I was prayed up, ready to go. He said, great. He said, the last of my test results just came back. It's affected your spine now. So now you're going to need emergency brain surgery and you're going to need emergency spine surgery. He said, I don't like to do two surgeries in the same day. So I took the liberty of, res of reserving the operating room six days from now we're going to take you back in and we're going to take care of your spine my goodness you know i i'm oh. listening to you <laughs> and when i'm telling you um that's why it's so important for us to have the right people in our circle yes. praying for us coming into agreement with us and what was more powerful than any not than anything but to also have a physician Yes. To be in alignment with yes. what you're believing God for. Yes. yes. And then from that point on, once I saw, I had a few naysayers in the beginning. And so my pastor and I, we literally prayed some tongues to be bridled because Come people on. were coming to me with things that just was not what my spirit was ready for. They would compare me to, yes, my grandmother had lung cancer and they tried chemotherapy with her, but she didn't make it. And I started hearing that and people were doing things like dropping off books. I'd come home and in my doorway, there'd be books about um, cancer and, and, and how to prepare death. And I, people thought they were helping. I had a very good friend who I love very dearly who um, said she was sending me something and it ended up being like five cancer scarves. Um, so I was here, some of the things that I was feeling, I know everybody was really trying to help me, but that's not where my spirit was going. So once we prayed for those tongues to be bridled, I started hearing everything I need to hear. The second, the oncologist told me, I asked him if he believed in God. He said, I'm trying to save lives. I don't do anything without the big man upstairs. So once I started getting this team and I felt like it was a team that God was putting together, then I, I was just on fire. I was just on fire. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah, and and the, the beauty of the whole thing is the healing that I had was truly miraculous. After the brain surgery, they told me that I would be in a hospital for about a week and then I'd have to go to rehab for about two weeks. They said my words would be slurred a little and I might stumble, but rehab would get me all fixed up in about two weeks and I should be okay. And this would extend my days. So instead of me leaving this world in six weeks to six months, they would get me closer to the six month period. And unbelievably, when they came back into, um, after the brain surgery, when um, I was supposed to be in the hospital for 
six months uh, in the hospital for six days at least, and then going to rehab, they literally came in hours after, I mean, hours after I had the surgery and I was doing fine. I wanted to pull something up. Um, I basically, this is, this is the picture of me and my children just hours after surgery. They said I shouldn't even be awake, but yet we're all in there talking, uh, laughing, and just thanking God that I'm still alive right now. And a little later on, once the family left, um, I had to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and um, the nurse, he came in the room and he was looking around. I could tell he was fumbling. He was like, Miss George, Miss George, are you here? And I said, sure, I'm in the bathroom. He said, how did you get there? I said, I walked. He said, what are you doing in there? I said, number one, he said, I need you to come out right now. So he got me out, got me back in bed and said, you can't do that again. You're not supposed to walk. I need to call your doctor. I don't even understand how we're talking to you right now. And so he called the doctor and the doctor said, well, it's the anesthesia. She's just kind of pushing through it right now, but probably in a couple hours, she'll be feeling differently. I ended up waking up the next morning. I was talking fine and the doctor came in, they brought all kind of um, physical therapists and other doctors doing all kind of tests, trying to figure out how I was talking and walking. And uh, he said, I'm just gonna observe you today and see what's going on and come back a little later. And later on, he came back and gave me a few more tests and said, we don't understand this, but I just signed your discharge papers. I said, well, what about rehab? Am I going to rehab? He said, you have already surpassed the expectations to be released from the rehab. So there's no need for you to go. So I was feeling good. We literally left the hospital, went straight from the hospital, went to, to the giant food store, got my prescription filled. I didn't want to sit in the car by myself. So I went in the, hot, in the grocery store with my husband. The prescription had to, they said, would take like five or 10 minutes. We did a little grocery shopping. I went home and I cooked dinner. You cooked dinner? Oh my God. Yeah. And then, then six days later, I went back into the hospital to have this spine surgery. They had to literally um, cut my throat to get to my spine. And they told me that I would not be able to um, speak for about a week. And I would probably have to drink out of a straw for probably about three weeks. And um, lo and behold, they did the surgery. I woke up the next morning. I was by myself and I kept thinking, how can I tell if I can talk or not? So I tried to say a prayer and it came out crystal clear. And the next thing I know, they brought in food. They were supposed to be bringing a liquid diet since I just had my throat cut and couldn't supposedly wasn't able to swallow. And they made a mistake and brought me in. Um, let's see if I can get this out the way. Brought me in French toast, bacon, and eggs and just left it there. I thought when I lifted up the dome, I was going to see applesauce or something like that. When I saw that food, I was so hungry because, you know, if you go into surgery, they make you stop eating like a day before. Yeah. But I was so hungry. I, I pushed the call button, of course, for the nurse to come in. But I'm so hungry. I said, I'm going to just take a little bowl of that French toast and just suck on it because I'm so hungry. I put it in my mouth and I tried to suck on it and it just slid down my throat. So I went and got a second one. And I thought, wait, I'm not supposed to swallow. I put that in my mouth, slid down my throat. The next thing I know, I went ahead and ate that whole plate. By the time the nurse came back in, that plate was cleaned. I mean, nothing left on it. So um, it just, and of course, they couldn't believe it. They came in again that morning, and he said, I hear you're in here talking and eating. I was like, yeah. He said, we don't understand this. We heard about you last week. They, he said, but based on what you're telling me and talking to me and whatever, he said, what's your pain level? I said, I'm not really in any pain. It feels a little scratchy. He said, you have to be in pain. I just cut your throat last night. I was like, no, I'm fine. And he went out and came back in and said, I just signed your discharge papers. You can go home. And I did the same thing. Left, went to the giant, did some grocery shopping, went home and cooked dinner. My gosh. Yeah. Now, I, I know that um, some of our listeners are probably saying, like, what level of faith does this young lady have? How did you get to that point where you can just stand on the word of God, like stand on your faith and know that God can do what he said in his word? I, I, would, I would say that initially 
I would think it came from my mother. I was always, she was a woman of faith. She brought me up in Sunday school. So I knew I had heard Bible stories about different people and things from the time I was a little girl. So um, I, I knew there was a, such a thing as faith. I never had to dig into my faith pocket that deep for anything that went on like that, but I did. And it, it made me feel good. It was, it, it made me feel good. I never, I tell people, and I, I, I know everyone processes it differently. So I don't mean to brag on this or anything like that, but I, I just through the entire thing. I, I never cried. When I got the information, I never cried. I never, it just didn't feel like it was in me to cry. And um, I, 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 it was hard for me to even believe that my children weren't falling apart and stuff. But even when I asked them, I, in my daughter Samara, I was like, did you ever cry? Did you feel like you had to cry? She said, I felt teary eyed a little. She said, but we were going off your strength. You made it clear every day. You never acted like this was going to be a death sentence for you. And we just went off of that. And then the miracles just started happening. Before I started chemotherapy, the, um, the day after the throat surgery, the spine surgery, I got a call from the, from the brain surgeon. And he said, he apologized. He said, I, I can't believe um, I gave you that diagnosis. He said, but the pathology report just came back from the tumor we took off your brain. He said, and every single thing in that x-ray and those scans showed it was cancer. But the pathology report said there is no cancer in your brain. So because of that, they downgraded your cancer from a stage four to a stage three, which now we're going to attempt to treat. They said that when it was stage four, there was nothing they could do but extend my day. So that was the first miracle. In fact, the doctor told me he apologized so much. I said, you don't have to apologize. I said, I believe I had cancer. He said, what do you think happened? I said, I have a God that works in the midnight hour. I said, you guys weren't going to treat me because it was fourth stage. He said, watch this. And by the time the last report came back, there was no cancer. And like I said, the, the doctor still went over it a couple times when I go in. He's like, see these white dots? This is, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that was the first miracle, just um, getting that downgraded. And then I went through three months of chemo. Um, they told me I would probably lose my hair. I would uh, lose weight. I tell people I got cheated on that one. Didn't even lose a pound. I didn't lose any of my hair. Um, they told me I'd be nauseated and fatigued. And um, I think there was one or two days when I felt like I needed to take a nap. And um, I had one day when I took a pill for no, uh, being nauseous, um, but I, it never, ever stopped me from eating. And we just, I just kind of, kind of plowed through it that way. Um, and then once the, chemo was done, we go back to the lung because that was the first thing. And the doctor did a biopsy to see if it had, uh, the tumor had shrank. And so after he did the biopsy, he calls me on the phone the next day and says, during the biopsy, we think we saw something. And he said, I don't want to move forward with the surgery unless I'm sure of what I saw. So wow. right away, I'm thinking, okay, this is starting to be a lot. My sister reminded me when I first wrote the book, it was going to be called, um, something like Job. She reminded me, she said, the way this is hitting you, first you have pneumonia, then you have third stage lung cancer, then you have fourth stage, now you have this, fine. She said, it's just so, as I, I, I prepared for this, um, I just kept thinking, is it going to be something else? And I uh, went in, he sent me in for some 3D x-rays and some mm -hmm. things like that. And he ended up calling me in a few days before surgery and said, um, I just want to call you and let you know that uh, it was the consensus of the tumor board that we move forward with the lobectomy. That means they're going to take your bottom, uh, the bottom half of your left lobe. You have two lobes in your left chest, an upper chamber and a bottom chamber. And the mass was on the bottom chamber. So he said it was our plan to just take off the bottom chamber. We, we were hoping to take off just the mass, but it's still too large. So we want to play it safe. We're going to take off the bottom uh, lobe, which will leave you with one lobe, which will be fine. He said, but when I saw what I thought I saw, I had to send you for more x-rays. He said, you have what we call a very strange anatomy. I said, what's that mean? He said, you have what we call a not uncommon. We don't know how we missed this. But when we went in to do the biopsy, you have three lobes in there. 
Now, when we take off one lobe, you're going to have two like everybody else. Somehow, he said, we're not sure. He said, how we missed working on you for a year and did not see this other lobe. And they, he was like, do you understand what I'm saying? I said, I totally understand. I said, I was created for a time such as this. God knew that I was going to need me an extra lobe. And he said, I'm going to put it in just in time. You don't need it now, but you will need it when they take in the day. It's it's a very crazy story, I know. But um, after that, I got the lung surgery. They told me I'd be in the hospital for a week. Um, I'd have to probably have some respiratory therapy and have to probably be on oxygen for a while to get myself uh, regulated with breathing again. And unbelievably, it was just a matter of a couple hours. They came in with all kind of breathing equipment to get me going. And they they were like, we don't understand it. They gave me a couple of tests and said, your breathing is strong as ours. It's like we did nothing to you at all. And wow. I said, what? Within 10 minutes, the doctor came in. He said, I'm not going to talk about this. We're, you're, we've been talking about you all over this hospital. He said, I just signed your discharge papers. I said, so I can go home. It, it was less than 24 hours I was in the hospital and released. It ended up that the beautiful part about it, I found out, is when you're not in the hospital for more than 24 hours, it's considered inpatient. Not, um, I mean, it's considered outpatient surgery. And so outpatient surgery is probably one third of the price of when you're in the hospital for 24 hours. So um, it just it just was just one thing after another. And God just kind of showed up and showed out. And I tell people in my case, he showed off. And it was such a miraculous healing that the hospital, I'll be about a month after lobectomy that I got a call from the marketing team that um, said they had heard about me. I had been reported to them from doctors and nurses and technicians. I was telling everybody when I went to get the x-ray, <laughs> Like, oh, we see here you have four stage lung cancer. We're so sorry. And I would say, I'm not going anywhere. This I'm good. God spoke to me. He's just using me. So I'll, I'll be okay. And so um, they reached out and said they wanted to know if I'd put a testimony on their webpage, which I said, yes, I'd love to. And then the next day they called and said, um, they told me they would call me the next day to let me know how to format the testimony. And they called the next day and said, we've been talking about you all afternoon. We want to know if we can do a video to put on the website with the testimony. And I said, sure. They said, okay, well, to do a video, you're going to have to meet with the team in Pittsburgh, which is like four and a half hours from us. Um, but we can do it via Zoom. And um, they just need to hear your story so they know how to do this video. Well, I met with about eight people from marketing at, at uh, UPMC via Zoom. And um, at now the end, tell us what's UPM. Oh, UPMC. UPMC is a conglomerate of hospitals throughout Pennsylvania and I think a few surrounding states because okay. um, it stands for, I wish I, I knew it. I know the P stands for Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, it's a lot. They probably have right now, I think they have about 60, uh, about 55 or 60 hospitals uh, that are a combination of hospitals, urgent care facilities, but they're all throughout Pennsylvania and they actually draw from a lot of surrounding states as well. Okay. Uh, so they said they they listen. They say your story is amazing. Uh, we're going to call you tomorrow and let you know when we're going to shoot the video for the website. And I said, oh, no, they said we're going to call you next week and let you know when we're going to shoot the video for the website. Well, they end up calling me the next day and said, we talked about you all afternoon. We verified everything that you said, and we decided we're skipping the little video for the website, and we want to do a full-fledged commercial with you, your husband, your kids, and your grandkids. So we end up shooting a phenomenal commercial um, that I was so, I'm so proud of, and I'm so proud of them because my biggest concern when they did the commercial is that they were just going to advertise or promote their hospital. But it was so clear, if you saw the commercial, if you go to the UPMC website, um, there's an article called Sam G, Faith Rewarded. And it's just unbelievable. And these are doctors in hospitals that are acknowledging that it was my faith that healed me. Come They're on. acknowledging that. Come on. They end up uh, telling me that um, the commercial looked really good and that they thought they were going to end up putting some of the uh, stills that they took in some brochures and things, but they would let me know when it got closer to the airing time. And about a week before the commercial aired, they called me and said, the commercial is such a hit that we're going beyond the commercial. 
We're doing bus panels. We're doing bus shelter stations. We're doing billboards, oh, we're doing magazines. Um, I can, it's just it's just a whole full blown campaign. And I was even last night. I, I've been praying with my my family, my sisters, and my husband about how do we promote this book. I, I when I was quarantined during the time, and I had to stay quarantined because I either was going into surgery or coming out of surgery or in chemo. This whole thing was a period of about six months with these six surgeries and the chemo. So it was all squeezed together and I had to keep myself healthy. So while I was quarantined, uh, God touched my heart and my hand and said, I need you to, to open your mouth and tell more people. You need a larger audience. So I was like, okay. He was like, write a book, write a book, write a book. That's all that kept coming to me. And I felt like, um, I felt like Moses. I felt like saying, God, who am I to write a book? I don't even read books. I don't even, I, I'm the hairstylist. This is, I, I said this is um, four decades because I don't want to sound too old, but really it's five decades. This is my 50th year as a hairstylist. And um, I, I do hair. I can curl circles around anybody, but I have no real typing skills. I didn't take those courses in school. So I just, I prayed on it. And um, every morning I was led to a scripture that said, uh, commit all your good works to the Lord and he will establish your plans. And I would say that every morning and I would get on there and just start plucking away. And um, the, I, I found a, a Christian publisher who reached out to me from me Googling how to write a book. And the next thing I know, I got to talking to him. I asked what my skill level was. And I told him that uh, how much I was writing a day. And they said, well, you should be done in about seven and a half months, which is pretty good because it takes people years to write books. And I said, okay, so I was satisfied with the seven and a half months. In fact, they told me, pick a goal. It looks like you're going to finish at the end of November. So why don't you say your goal is that you're going to finish by Thanksgiving? And I said, okay, that'll be great. I said, no, I got one better. I'm going to be 65 the day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday. That's going to be my goal. Well, before I knew it, that book was done in two and a half months. I had finished that book in May, almost four, four and a half months before schedule. Wow. Look and so, that. and so the, 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 the audience, like I said, was giving my testimony in any, any place from a grocery store to a parking lot, to Lowe's, to birthday parties, but I still felt like I needed a larger audience. And it started getting a little wearisome with me and my husband lugging around the tables to the different fairs and the libraries, doing the book signings and that type of thing. So a few weeks, just about three weeks ago, uh, we started praying that, Lord, tell me what to do now. You you keep putting it on my shoulders. I need a larger audience. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Send me something. And I could not believe Thursday when I got a call from UPMC that said that my <laughs> my commercial you can't make this stuff up. I'm telling you. you. My, my commercial was selected to be ran before and during, 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 during the Super Bowl last night. My so God. It just, it just, it just was well, amazing. Say that again. Say that again. You know how many people, like, we understand the magnitude of having a commercial during the Super Bowl. <laughs> I, I the territory you are in that does not matter. Let me tell you to have a commercial during Super Bowl, like people wait for commercials. I, I I watch the Super Bowl every year, and I watch for basically the commercials and the halftime show. So right away, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this I, it just it was just I don't know what to say. It, it it was just God. There's no way I should be in a commercial during Super Bowl, but it allowed me to spread that message. And one of the things I loved about UPMC, I told them I knew they were promoting their hospital, but they had to to keep some of my God stuff in there. You couldn't take all of it out. And in the commercial, I actually say um, it, it, it's a, a if you go to the website, you'll be able to pick up the commercial um, that's on the faith rewarded article that they have in there. It's at the bottom. But in the commercial, I say, when I got, I got the diagnosis, I said, no tears, just prayers. And that jumps out at you so much. And I had so many calls last night. I mean, the minute the, the commercial um, aired, I just, my phone was just, text was just bing, 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 where just everybody who knew me was calling saying, saying the commercial just ran. It's beautiful. A lot of people I didn't know, um, so I didn't get a chance to tell, but it just, I thought it was pretty amazing. And I'm sure that somebody was touched by that commercial. 
I've already had people say that they watched the commercial and the commercial spoke to them. They had a cough and they decided to go to the doctor or they had some kind of ache, but there was something about that commercial that made them get up and go out. I had one, uh, a friend, uh, not even a friend, uh, a stranger reach out to me and said that she had a dentist appointment and she was putting off everything she could to go to that dentist appointment. She was having some kind of root canal and she decided, I'm, not, I'm just not going, I'm just sit here today and just not go. And she said that it was another talk show I was on. And she said, when she heard my testimony in that talk show, she looked at her watch and said, I think I can make it. And she <laughs> I'm going to the dentist. I'm going to the dentist. <laughs> she said, if this lady can go through all that, who am I to sit here and complain about a daggone root canal? Come on. Yeah. That is there, phenomenal. There any promises and scriptures that I stood on. I mean, I think about the woman with an issue of blood. I mean, for 12 years, she went through, went through, spent a bunch of money, had a bunch of work done with nothing. But when she heard that Jesus was coming to her town, she knew she was determined to get to him. If it meant getting on the ground, because if you got to touch the hem of somebody's garment, you're not standing up. Chances are you're getting down pretty low. But she had so much faith that she didn't believe if God prays for me. Or if Jesus prays for me, if Jesus lays hands on me, if Jesus hears my story, all she believed was if I just can touch the hem of his garment. And so I kept thinking of these things, you know, the 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 lots of um, sheroes and heroes throughout the Bible. I think about the, the three Hebrew boys who were destined to be thrown into a fiery furnace and be burnt up. Yes. If they bow down to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but they said they're not doing it. And they were just kids. They were just like teenagers. They said, we're not going to do it. Our God will save us. And as they were thrown in, they're all bound up and tied. Before you know it, the king looked in and said, didn't we throw three men in that fire? Well, now I see four and one looks like the son of God. That right there, those kind of things. Come on. Right there, it just kept me going. There, there's all kinds of scriptures throughout the Bible that let you know that faith is the best kept. Not, I keep telling people the best kept secret to those people aren't saints, but we know it's not a secret. We just need to use it and we need to tap into it. But all those kind of things let me know that God is still on the throne and faith is a big deal. It doesn't matter whether it's something like uh, for many younger people on, you might just be trying to get into the college of your choice and got a rejection letter. That doesn't right. mean you're not going to that college. Maybe there was a job that you knew you were going to get. You thought you nailed the interview and it didn't come through. That doesn't mean you're not getting that job. Before you know, they're going to call and say the, the applicant or the candidate that we planned on having now is moving to Timbuktu. And we, it, it's just, you cannot even imagine how much power is in faith. Just believing trusting, knowing, not thinking or assuming, but knowing, and then not being afraid to verbalize it by opening your mouth. The word tells us it's the blood of the lamb and the, and the testimony of our mouth that encourages other people. One thing I've learned is that the things that we go through are not for us. These challenges, these struggles, they're for someone else. They're so that one day your grandchildren or your children or your neighbor or somebody will remember that lady, remember aunt so-and-so. They gave six weeks to live, and she, I felt like Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, like I went through something and came out not even smelling like smoke. I tell people all the time, if it wasn't for medical bills, I wouldn't even know I went through that. This month is one year since they took half my lung, and they start counting from the time they take the last mass off your body. Mm -hmm. So it's been one year now that the doctors are saying, I'm cancer free. They told me, they said, we're not even supposed to tell anybody for five years, anything like this, but we just redid every scan that we did a year ago. And it's like, it's a whole different body. Everything has literally disappeared. My God, this is amazing. This is a phenomenal. This is what Faithful Moments is all about. Having radical faith. To yeah. believe what we cannot see. We cannot see. In the natural and understanding that we, we pray. So when you were mentioning that um, you you um, called your pastor and you 
the pastor organized a prayer group and then your family and you all have prayer warriors coming together. And so that was a level of people committing and being, you know, on the same page aligned, like they're connecting with your faith. Like you cannot let anybody in that has any doubt <laughs> to join. But there's two things that I took away, two C's that I know is important when we're believing God for something like this. It's commitment and consistency. Mm -hmm. You all had a time, you all had a set fast and you all stuck to it. There mm -hmm. was consistency and there was a commitment mm -hmm. and connecting your faith there and God honored that. Amen. So we just thank Amen. you. God. Amen. Just Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yeah. My goodness. Now I know I know a whole bunch of people have been touched by your testimony. Um, I'm just a little passer buyer, a, a little bird that heard about your story and said, listen, you have to have Miss Sam come on to your platform. Miss uh Rosalie. Yes, very good friend of mine since, since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Since yeah. kindergarten, your kindergarten. Friend. And she's way out there in Texas now, and I'm here, and somehow we still connected back. And uh, she was probably one of the first people who must have heard about what uh, I was going through my journey. And she gave me a phone call, and uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard from her in years. But she's been a dear friend forever. And just because you don't see somebody every week or you don't text them or call does not mean that that's not still in your heart. And I, I just loved when I heard about her and when I saw her on your, your broadcast uh, just last week or a week or so ago, I was like, and she was like, you know, she has to, you need to connect with her. You know, when I saw the name of the program, Faithful Moments, I was like, okay, there's another place I can open up my mouth. Yes, yes, yes. So we don't want to um, not have you share your book. Can you please put your book up there again? I know that everyone's going to um, be able to read your testimony that you share with us. Um, is there a plan in the future to have maybe a prayer group or? Well, something? right now, I believe it or not, I've been very busy with prayer lines. I'm probably at least uh, once or twice a week, I'm on a prayer line or I'm doing a podcast or a lot of book clubs. I'm surprised I have a lot of uh, book clubs from churches that are reaching out that have decided that um, they selected my book to be the, the book of choice that they're, they're going to read this winter or something. So um, right now, I'm just letting God lead me. I, 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 I'm still like this. I'm honestly... To me, it's still so unbelievable. Every time I tell this story or give this testimony, even now, I swear, I feel like I'm talking about somebody else. That is, it couldn't be me. I, it couldn't be me. And so right now, I'm just I'm just trying to be obedient. I know that uh, my one of my purposes for still being here is that I have to open my mouth. And this is a testimony that I must share. So right now, any way I can share it, whether it's a, a prayer line, uh, I don't I don't have any plans to write another book. But then again, I had no plans to write this book. Um, right. But but I'm just I'm just going to follow and how the Lord leads me. I'm just continuing to ask Him for direction. But I I know that uh, this testimony is for somebody out there on your uh, on broadcast, your broadcast, right? Most definitely. Most definitely. And um, I, I just want to remind people that, that God is still on the throne. He's still in the miracle making business. And if there's another report, I mean, my doctors, I, I respected everything. And I really respected when I finally linked up with doctors who believed in God. But there's a scripture that says it's written. Okay. I have not seen, ear has been heard, neither has entered the heart of man, the plans God has for those who love him. So what that means broken down is ain't nobody seen the last report, ain't nobody heard the last report, and God hasn't laid it on no one's heart to come and tell you what the last report is. They might have report, but their report is far from the final report. Come on. Come on. So I am just adding some of your information here um, where the book can be purchased. You all can purchase the book on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, you know what? And I can also let you, you tell them. 
too. Okay, well, it can be purchased on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Apple Books. This, you can even get it from Walmart um, online and Target and some other places. Um, I will say this, though. I don't know how long it's going to last. And I don't know what Amazon has going on right now. But they literally lowered my book to $7.74, 50% off. They did it um, back for Good Friday, during the Good Friday um, sale. And now they brought that back. They brought it back about three weeks ago for two days, took it off. And now I notice it's back on again. So I don't know how long that's going to last, but for $7.74, that's that's a pretty good deal on that book. To hear that yes, testimony. Yes. So you can get it there. Um, you can always follow what I'm doing on Facebook. I go by my name on Facebook. It's Sam Met George. And I normally uh, try to keep posted anything I'm doing in the community or any podcast I give or um, just words of inspiration. And then there's also my, um, I have Instagram. The Instagram is, um, it's what, uh, the Instagram is fewer chosen the book. Okay. Then I have a website that is fewerchosenthebook.com. And I have an email that's fewerchosenthebook at gmail.com. But um, definitely follow me on Instagram, which is fewer chosen the book, or my uh, my Facebook, which is Samet, S A M E T T E, George, G E O R G E. Okay, and I'm just putting, um, I, I typed it out so that I can put it on the screen for everyone. So they have a lot of different options to reach you. And I'm going to put this here. This has been phenomenal. I hope that you are very pleased with our platform, that your testimony aligned with you know, the beliefs around faithful moments. Um, yes. I had a daughter that was diagnosed with a terminal illness and they did also give her a limited time to, to um, live as well. And so I know what it means to have crazy radical faith and to go against the odds. Yes. And so, um, so I'm very excited. I'm very excited. I'm so happy I'm happy for you. God has truly blessed you. If you could just say that phrase that God, like that does something to me. Like, can you please say that phrase that God said to you one more time? Because it has been fulfilled and it's still being fulfilled. Yes. Yes. I woke up and after cleaning myself up from the crusted eyes and realizing that uh, I had been crying in my sleep, God spoke to me and it wasn't a dream. It wasn't God. I, he laid it on my heart. He spoke with a real voice. And he said, he started by calling out my name. He said, Sam, this is not about you. This is all about me. I need to use you to let my light shine through, to be a beacon, to draw others to my kingdom. There are too many that do not believe I'm still on the throne and still in the miracle making business. You just need to use you. My God. And that's that's pretty much pretty much what he did. I, I know that uh, it was the kind of thing where he wanted to make a point. Like it can't be nobody but God. I mean, <laughs> it's just you you can't if he had just cured me from COVID, it wouldn't have made a big impression. But to be able to to uh, heal somebody from fourth stage where they said I only had, you know, a short time where there was nothing, nothing they could do. But thank God, I, uh, I praise a, a living savior. Thank God he's the great physician. Thank God he's our own personal Jehovah Rapha. Thank God that we can depend on Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Like you said, you had, and and I, I feel like I had a bold, uh, a kind of bold faith because we went through some things every night in prayer when I'm going through this journey. This is before um, the, the lung operation all through the um, the chemotherapy. I mean, when we prayed at night, our prayers were very strong. And not only did we pray for God, but we, we called the devil in and we give him a few words of advice. As to if he didn't leave this body, what was getting ready to happen? You getting ready to get zapped? 
You can write get burnt up. If that doesn't work, we go. I got a man who's ready to scalpel and cut you up. Um, this is this is not your home. You can't live here. Jesus Christ lives in this body. So we suggest that you get out while the getting's good. And I mean, we would get very, very radical with a few choice words for the devil because sometimes you got to talk to him in his language. And um, it just, like I said, my faith was a little bolder, but guess what? The word tells us you only need a mustard seed of faith. You don't have to be somebody who was raised in the Sunday school and, and, and doing things in church. Deacon. No, not at all. A mustard seed. I don't know if every, everyone's out there has seen a mustard seed, but it is so tiny. It's just a little bit bigger than a, a, a grain of salt. Yes. But that's all you need. That's all you need. God just wants to get the glory in the end. He just wants to get the praise and the honor. And to me, that's not a lot to ask for saving my life. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Well, uh, Sam, I am going to let you pray us out if you don't mind if you would speak a blessing over our audience. So um, on Faithful Moments, this platform is um, open to Ghana. So Africa, like you are okay. literally around the world, over 25,000 individuals aside from my platform in the U.S. and other groups and your, your word and your message is just being spread out. So I would like for you to go ahead and, and say a prayer for us. Okay. Pray with me. Most gracious and heavenly father, Lord, we come to you right now because truly you are so awesome, so wonderful, so excellent, so amazing. And you are worthy of all of our worship because you are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of Kings. You are the great physician. Oh in our own personal Jehovah Rapha. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for everything you've done for us, Lord, everything. Lord, we ask that everybody on this platform, Lord, that you will search our circle and search our hearts. And if there's anything that either of us have done that's not Christ-like, Lord, we ask that you just forgive us and do what you do best. Throw in us here forgetfulness, never to be remembered. Lord, then build us all up to be the best Christians we can be, the best Christian sons and daughters and uncles and aunties and sisters and brothers and girlfriends and guy friends and neighbors and co Lord, just build us up to, to, to represent you the way you want to be represented. Lord, we don't mean to do anything against you. So if there's ever been anything we've done that has made you not proud to say we are your children, please just fix us. Yes. So we thank you for everything you've already given us, Lord. Lord, you give us so much. Just the fact that we're able to, we were able to wake up this morning and take a breath is a reason to say thank you, Jesus. Even though we may have aches and pains here or there, we won't complain because we know it's still so much better to be six feet above ground than six feet under. So we say thank you, Lord. And then we thank you for all that other stuff you give us that has nothing to do with our living or our being or anything that we do, our cars and our homes and our bank accounts and whatever. Lord, just thank you for it all. Lord, but right now I'm asking that you send your Holy Spirit down to cover this entire audience, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, that you will encourage us to keep you on our mind and in our heart. Lord, we ask that you just touch anyone on this platform who is, has any type of a, a, a need for a healing, Lord, any type of a blessing, any type of confusion. Lord, whatever is going on in their mind from here all over the universe, Lord, we ask right now that you just send your Holy Spirit down to comfort us and remind us that you work behind the scenes. Yes, Lord. Lord, we ask right now that whatever is going on with people, that you start orchestrating those things people around them to get in alignment with you, Lord. We pray that you order every step that we all take through whatever journey that we're coming up against, Lord. And to just remember, if nothing else, to remember that you are King, you are Lord, and you are ours. All these blessings with us in your son's name. And we love you. Amen. 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 So thank you so very much, Miss Sam. 
I want to tell you it was an honor and a privilege to be able to have you on Faithful Moments. I want to thank our audience. Thank you all so very much for joining us on this evening. I know that you were blessed. And so for those of you that are joining us for the first time, Faithful Moments is a talk show where we stand on the word of God. We don't just speak and read the word of God, but we work frame the word of God to life. And so we thank you so very much for joining us. I am your host, Dr. Shimona Wembley, and I look forward to seeing you next week, Monday, for another episode of Faithful Moments. Blessings. Blessings. <laughs>